This is the third LC Jain Memorial Lecture. On behalf of the Association for Democratic Reforms, it's our honor and privilege to co-host this with the Lakshmi Chand Jain family. Uh, many of you probably know him far better than we do, but a brief few words of introduction. Um, he was a very passionate freedom fighter as a young man and dropped out of college. And after independence, he had a very distinguished career. And it's too long to list, but we will just mention a few things. Uh, he started working on the uh, cooperatives, uh, on people's movements. He was the chairman of the uh, Khadi uh, Commission. He was on the planning commission. He was an ambassador to South Africa. He was a winner of the Maxese Award. And the list goes on and on, an author, activist, thinker. But there are a few things that may or may not be known uh, I wanted to mention. There are uh, civil society uh, leaders, and he was certainly one of them. But towards the later part of his life, uh, we found that he had grown into a mentor and a guru for several people. Uh, one of the persons whom he used to mentor is our keynote speaker here today. And uh, the list is long. You know, people like Aruna Roy and Medha Patkar and several others uh, he has worked with and mentored, and even other younger people. He was also a great supporter of ADR, so we are particularly honored uh, to co-host this. The previous two LCJN lectures, uh, the first one was delivered by uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, uh, who needs no introduction, and the second one by Professor Ashutosh Varshney. Um, a few words of introduction about our speaker. I think many of you know her also. Uh, Aruna is a very well-known, uh, I don't know, she would like to call herself an activist and a leader. Uh, she was in the Indian Administrative Services, as many of you know, and quit that service to work for society. Uh, she's also a Maxese Award winner, and among the many achievements uh, of her group, the MKSS, uh, to our mind, two of them stand out. One is the Right to Information Act, which has empowered millions of people, or practically all the Indians in this country. Uh, so we would like to thank you for your contribution to that and also the passage of the uh, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, MNRGA, which has been a big boon for uh, the rural poor. So thank you very much, Arunaji, for uh, agreeing to deliver this lecture. And uh, we would like to uh, listen to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Triluchan, Jagdeep, comrades in the RTI movement preceded the RTI with some of their excellent work in the disclosure of candidates before the elections. We are all wedded together by common concerns. And I see so many of you, activists, people who have led so many different movements. And I feel privileged to be asked to deliver this lecture. Lakshmi, Devaki, and the boys, as I used to think of them when they lived in Jorbag many years ago. Now, of course, Srinivasan is a name on, and a figure and a face on television, and I'm really happy when his truth versus hype takes us to areas which people normally don't go. Gopal, though hidden, I know exists somewhere doing some very good work. And all of you senior members of civil society in this room, my mentors in many ways, people I've admired. So I place my ideas in front of you today as a kind of offering to Lakshmi's life, to what he did for so many of us, the help he gave so generously, the time he gave so generously, and the complete equality in the relationships he had with many of us. A younger, 
immat more immature, less worthy in many ways, but he never made us feel at any time that we were not worthy of listening. Two, of course, he also respected us because he dissented with us, and dissent is a form of respect. And today is India to say that. I don't know why we need to say that, but we have to say it over and over again. To dissent with somebody is a mark of equality. That you feel them worthy enough to say, I don't agree with you, and therefore I have a different opinion, instead of tolerating them. Kitne logon ko angrezi nahi samaj mein aata hai, his audience mein. Uh, in the middle, I'll break into Hindi because my colleagues from the MKSS who have come today uh, to honor Lakshmi because he was part of those two extraordinary movements. They met him so many times, are uh, not very familiar. Some of them do not know at all. Some are not familiar with English. Civil disobedience in uncivil times ka arthiya hai कि असभ्य वक्त में सत्याग्रह का क्या मतलब है? अंत पंथ में सभ्य सत्ता हो, सभ्य सरकार हो, तो उसके सामने सत्याग्रह का सत्य का स्थापना करने में कुछ हमारा भी उसमें भूमिका रहता है। हम भूकर्ताल करते हैं, तो हमारे मानसिकता भी बढ़ा बढ़ता है, उनका भी सम्मान बढ़ता था। आजकल भूकर्ताल करने पे लोग कहते हैं म मुद्दे को तो समाधान करने की जरूरत नहीं है इस परिपेक्ष में बोल रही हूं मैं माफी चाहूंगी मैं ज्यादा अंग्रेजी में बोलूंगी आप लोगों को जहां तक समझ फिर बाद में मैं वो भी कहती हूं इन द मिडस्ट ऑफ ऑल ऑफ यू फ्रॉम दिल्ली हु हैव बीन सच एक्सट्रॉर्डिनरी इन्फ्लुएंसेस एंड फैक्टर्स दैट हैव बिल्ट इनटू द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ ऑल द मूवमेंट्स हैव बीन पार्ट ऑफ आई आल्सो हैव विद मी नॉर्थी हु हैज बीन माय गुरु एक्चुअली टॉट मी वर्कर्स पॉलिटिक्स who taught me how to work within the Dalit framework of women's rights against Sati for minimum wages, who fought a battle that went to the Supreme Court and we won that battle. Shankar, who has of course been an extraordinary comrade and colleague, are also here amongst others. So I would like to tell them, I'm sorry I'm speaking in English, but uh, Shankar, you can translate a little bit to your friends and then maybe later we'll know what I said. So I begin with an apology. And it's not strange for me to apologize for language. I'm a Tamilian, like Devaki, <laughs> brought up in northern India, so more familiar with Hindi than with English. And I'm asked not to ever speak Tamil when I go south. All my friends say to me, please don't talk your Brahminical Tamil, terrible Tamil, keep it. You just speak in English and pretend you're Bengali. <laughs> Which has also stood me in good stead. Anyway. Today, we have all come here to really remember Lakshmi, who lived his values. It's such a rare thing today to have somebody who lives his or her values. My generation and his generation were separated by a decade or a decade and a half. And as I look behind me, I feel this is becoming more and more rare as a species in this country in terms of percentages. The numbers may not have decreased, but the percentage definitely has. And Lakshmi profile was that of the old India. We really were a dignified country. And the dignity lay in the fact that we not only respected what was Indian, but were equally happy to critique what was Indian, to have no compunction in saying things were wrong with our civilization that needed to be set right. Also believed in a changing world we boasted of intellectuals who are not ashamed of being intellectuals. And we also boasted of great activists. And they were not enemies of each other. Our intellectuals were also activists in the entire independence movement. People who thought also acted. And people who acted also thought. But today, it's become a bad word if you're an intellectual. And if you, are, if you have an ideology which is left of the center, then you're damned. Anyway, so I don't know why it has become necessary to say these things, things which in my upbringing and in my youth were taken for granted as situations of thought, of independence, of ideas, of differences, of perceptions that were important for everybody and stood cheek to jowl with others which were equally 
equally contradictory, but everyone had a say, and everyone had a place in the sun. As I was thinking about it, I wanted to call India a nation, but the moment I used that word, I stopped short. Because the moment you say nation today, you think of Arnab Goswami. <laughs> well, you also think of the fact that on this issue of a nation, nationhood, and nationality, we've had so many controversies. It's, been, it's become a word with layers of pejorative meanings. It's become a word with interpretations and misinterpretations. Nationalism, a derivative, has been used as a very narrow concept. Anti-national is the tool of every political party which wants to damn you. So if you have dissent, you become anti-national. And of course, it's a denial, it's a victimization, it's also culpability. So this labeling and stigmatizing for selling fear and hate, words have been used and misused. Another very important person who's no longer alive called Nilab Mishra, who's editor of a paper when he died, very young at 53, and who was also a public intellectual and who spoke and wrote, used to say that we do in this public sphere have to think of semantics and language because we communicate only through language. And any control over any phrase or any idea is so complete in this fast growing world of quick everything, of social media exchange, of what is it called though? The, uh, not Facebook, the uh, Twitter. So within 10 syllables or 20 syllables or 25 syllables, you could say everything. So everything's reduced. And so words get really distorted. And I always think that perhaps you'll forgive me, but I have friends here from my literature career in college and teaching a bit, that I always think of what Humpty Dumpty said to Alice when she questioned him about the use of a word. And he said, a word, when I use it, means what I mean, mean it to be. She said, but that can't be the whole meaning. But he says it's the power that defines the word. And today, with so many coined, no many phrases that have been coined, we are all stigmatized. This kind of division between ethics and convenience, it's very strange that this whole world today, and I read an article by a young, young man, a not born white American, who said that our entire world is dominated by convenience. So what is convenient becomes more important than anything else. The morality of it, the ethics of it, the culpability of people who use a certain item and what happens to others, whether you're talking about use of technology, whether you're talking about use of commercial goods, it's the convenience that rules us. So this convenience that has come to stay as a very much very important part of our existence often gets misinterpreted as peace. So therefore, obedience to that kind of concept becomes necessary for peace. And I know many of my friends would misinterpret peace as cowardice, as silence, as not talking. But that's not what Lakshmi did, and that's not what this civil disobedience means. Civil disobedience actually means expressing your point of view and really standing your ground. Gandhi, through Satyagraha, made a link between civil disobedience and truth. And that's been a struggle for all of us activists. How do you establish whatever is a relative or limited truth? through civil disobedience. And it's really a call to the conscience and not to a vote. And that's so distinctive a difference today. As I stand in front of you, I know that the call to the conscience and the negation of deceit is really important. So the role of a conscientious objector, a man who dissents, whether it is a rationalist or whether it's somebody who thinks differently, has really been put down in India today. Gandhiji also drew some kind of contours of the, of the concept of nonviolent protest, which I think we all carry the seeds of inside us. And it's a part of the Indian texture of protest, and it's such a ter terrific strength. And I remember um, simple things, like the first time I went on the street, uh, 
as part of a street march. With all the conditionings that we all have. When you go out and you shout a slogan, you think everyone's watching you. Everyone's thinking, oh, look at that woman. She's shouting a slogan. But it's not like that, of course. Nobody cares what you shout. But I find today that even amongst the youth, there are very many, even within a closed room, so hesitant to shout a slogan, hesitant to raise your voice. Similarly, I also found that when I stood, many of these protests, totally unarmed with the police in front of me, no violence at all, no brick batting, no fighting, no abusive slogans. But when there is a cordon which is eight feet deep, nine feet deep, there is fear. And I always say to people who abuse this concept of nonviolence, I ask them, what is more courageous? I ask myself, I didn't tell them, I ask myself, what is more courageous? That as an IAS officer, I stood behind the STM, as an STM, behind rows of cops who were armed and a lot of policemen ready to order anything from tear gas to firing. And I've st stood on the other side and faced them. I said, what requires more courage? How can you call this the tool of a coward? So nonviolence as a creed has to be talked all over again. Many of us in this room know it. And you're so many of you know it better than I do. But when I face young people today, the whole history lesson has to be repeated. The whole lesson on democracy and politics has to be repeated. The whole se sequence of events from the time of our independence to today have to be repeated. History has to be repeated. And I know great scholars of history are sitting in this audience whose books guide us. So history has to be retold. And in Rajasthan, where textbooks have been distorted, in Maharashtra, where textbooks have been distorted, and many other states where huge chunks of history have either been removed or rewritten, we have a huge battle ahead, no matter whether there is a change of government in Rajasthan today or not. The textbooks are going to be a huge problem, and we'll have to fight it. And to what extent the new government will change the textbooks, go back to the older textbooks, remains to be seen. I was uh, reading an email from an old friend who sent me a Howard Zinn quotation, and I'd like to read that to you, about civil disobedience. He says, you say our problem is civil disobedience, but that's not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. He says, our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who obey the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war, and millions have been killed because of this obedience. Our problem is that people are obedient all over the world in the face of poverty and starvation and stupidity and war and cruelty. Our problem is that people are obedient while the jails are full of petty thieves and all the while the grand thieves are running the country. It's something in our songs with Shankar and all my friends sing. We sing these things over and over again. And of course people say, you're anti National, you're not, you're not proud of your country. You keep saying, chori vado, gado ho re, koi to munde bolo. And what do you mean by this? You shouldn't be saying it. Wo bhi kha gaya, ye bhi kha gaya. They have great objections. Apne desh ki bezati karte ho. And when Shankar and I went to the US on a lecture tour in 2002, and Shankar sang this song in, in North Carolina, there was a huge reaction to Shankar, saying, izzat ne rakte ho apne desh ki. You come abroad and you talk such nonsense. And Shankar said, you know, I don't have a green card. I haven't come to stay in the US. I love my country. I'm there. And I fight my people over there. So what do you mean by saying izzat nahi hai? Bahut izzat hai. Bahut samman hai. Isi liye maha rehte hai. So this is the nature of Indian protest and Indian civil rights movements in this country. But we have to continually define ourselves and of course, my generation all listened to Bob Dylan. The times they are changing. Now, of course, he's a Nobel laureate. And so things have and always will change. This word itself has developed into a great political tool now. Hum badlaav laenge. What kind of badlaav? Kis se kaha? Kya tha? Aur kaha le jaoge? Badlaav by and of itself is not a laudable thing. Where are you taking me? 
So thank God in this particular set of elections, Badlav did not play any role. But Badlav may come back in 2019. These questions have to be asked. Actually, the biggest difference I find, which disturbs me the most as a person who was born over the cusp of independence and who has emotional memories of partition, because I grew up in Delhi, the bloodbath was the post the partition. Maybe because Gandhiji's life was given up for peace. I met Radmohan Gandhi recently and he said, Gandhi's assassination gave us 40 years of peace. Maybe. Because it was such a huge thing. Huge attack on a great man that even the people who bade for other kinds of things got lulled into quietness and silence. In his book, Lakshmi writes about how in Kingsway camp, when prisoners, I mean, sorry, refugees were there, and how they really did not want to meet Gandhiji because they were upset with partition, and how they changed when he was assassinated. He also speaks about how Nehru came to Kingsway camp. This is a book I've carried with me, but I like it so much that I wanted to read the whole book. So I have decided not to, but just to refer to it. So it's in this that we now find people baying for blood. And I don't know how many of you interact with people, not in Delhi, but uh, not in polite society, but outside. And the language has become so crude. And it's frightening. That if blood and the spilling of blood can be extolled, then society has really undergone some kind of basic psychological change. And somewhere I feel responsible for it. Because I am the generation that has probably not understood the younger people, not understood what was brewing and what was happening. Those of us who live in Swachh Bharat, and what a thing Swachh Bharat is, I won't go into. And what my friend Bezawada Wilson says about Swachh Bharat. He says, I don't know how many of you know about the Safai Karamchari Andolan and about Bezawada Wilson, he who himself is a Safai Karamchari, and he says, what will the PM, he says, what will the PM teach me about Safai? I'm a PhD, he's only in nursery. And I know what happens, that hundreds of people die in the sewers and gutters of India, while we still talk about Swachh Bharat. So it's at the cost of the lives of fellow citizens that we are Swachh today. And if we raise these issues, then it brings to mind, my mind, a favorite line of mine from Shakespeare, from Lear, where he said, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. And Lear is being exposed to the elements and he's out there in the jungle. If I misquote him, as flies to wanton boys are we to the ambitious, they lynch us for their sport. The lynching phenomena that's begun in India is absolutely for me unbelievable because lynching is the worst kind of public crime you can commit. Because it not only is a crime against one individual, but by all of us in society. And the things that have happened in Rajasthan in the last four years have really pushed me into a kind of negative misery. And I've had to pull myself out each time because it's been celebrated. Lynching has been celebrated. Lynching has been extolled. Lynching has been spread around on social media. And people don't stop even to rub it off the WhatsApp. It spread forwarded more and more and more. And this is, to me, an India I can't recognize. And I don't know whether it can ever be changed, but we should try. And in small efforts, when we've made a small effort, there has been a change. And these are efforts where you sit down and talk to people, where you really re respect them as individuals, but still want them to change. It never can happen in lectures. So you have to spend time at the cutting edge. Now the voices that should have been raised in protest because of fear, I don't know what kind of fear we've all been possessed with, has, should have been a huge roar. I think in India the women have done very well, I'll come to it. But we should have been roaring against this. We should have been yelling against this. But it was just a whimper of us activists saying it everywhere, talking about it, People saying, oh, you'll be lynched, you keep quiet, don't say this because somebody will do something to you. And this is not what I heard from Lakshmi. 
This is not what I heard from his generation. This is not what I heard from India, which had faced the ire of the British Empire, but had not hesitated to speak the truth. What we failed to do thereafter, in many ways, is really shocking. After the set of unscientific thoughts that have been publicly expressed, one judge says that the peacock's tears impregnate the peahen. We keep quiet. One minister says Darwin was all wrong. We keep quiet. There is no public outcry that such, we don't want to hear such nonsense. And actually there are Sanskrit shlokas which prove that there was an evolution. If you, I mean, as a dancer, I mean, I learned dancing for a brief while in Kalakshetra and I know that when the Natashastra was taught to me, there was Matsya Kurmavara, which was the evolution, actually. So if you want to quote the scriptures, quote it properly. There's no voice which speaks about what is right, even within the realm of religion. What we have failed, therefore, to do is to speak out as a nation. And therefore, for me, now the most vital thing in this country is to speak, to express yourself, to say it loudly and clearly in the public domain, no matter what the consequences. India has also ex existed in two separate compartments. We have people who want this eternal peace of convenience and therefore vote electorally one way. And this is also the people I work with. And when it comes to the issue of justice, they, vote, they will have a completely different agenda. Sangathan wale ya matlab activist ka toh humara koi maina nahi hai. Ab kya kar loge? Ab na toh rishwat khaoge, na toh humare kaina maanoge, na ab kisi aur ki cheez karoge. Uske liye toh wo nita hai. Magar jab koi nyaya anyaya ki ladai hoti hai na, tab aap humare liye bhoat mehat poor. To is dichotomy ke beech mein hum rehte hain. And it's a dichotomy I think most of us practice. Why? And this is another huge conundrum for us that we have to address. Again, convenience and comfort have become the dominant gods. And politics has played very, very cleverly into this crack. And even today, where I stand a little more hopeful than I've ever been in the last five years, of possibly something being a little easier, I think the first thing one does grab is the space to talk. We have to grab space for protest, which has been denied us. We must grab all the various places of, for civil disobedience that have been disallowed us. We must grab that space now. And we must negotiate with all the political establishments that have got power today to say, if you don't give that, you don't give us anything. The first thing is you give us the space for civil disobedience and protest. And I think it's critically important that we do so. And therefore, people who say, like Gandhiji said, means and ends must match. And I think it's true. No matter what you do, your means and ends must match. And as they say in Hindi, karni aur katni mein farak nahi hona chahiye, which my colleagues are very fond of saying all the time. So now when some of us feel the need for sympathizing with the ethical, and we find a climate which is not very comfortable, and often in Delhi I feel it's an uncomfortable climate. I know all my friends say, very difficult to find anybody who has sympathy. You're always arguing against this idea and against that idea. All of us want levels of moral comfort, and many of us gravitate towards rural India, whether it's Chhattisgarh or whether it's Rajasthan or anywhere. And in that zone of ethical comfort, we go and work with people with whom at least you can argue about reality. At least it's not an argument based on some kind of far-fetched idea, it's a reality. Whether you should get the grain or not, whether you can open the ration shop or not, whether the SDM is being hostile or not, whether the policeman is beating you up or not, it's a reality which surrounds you. And when we do that, we are called, nowadays, activists. And when we go to the marginalized and we get involved with them, then comes the great definition of us as anti-national. When we amplify the voices of people, we become targets of this government. For the government doesn't want anything said against it. So when that happens, you have five people go to jail, who 
ridiculous the, the whole FIR that was filed against them. And then the manufacturing of crime against innocent people, those of us who have been in the civil service, and I can see some here, is so easy. It's not difficult to manufacture anything that you can use against people, and in India we have done it. People then, to fight all this, have started through singing through songs and singing through slogans. And that's the way you get around this whole stopping of protest. So song and slogans have been very, very important. And one of the important campaigns has been the RTI because it's established the legitimacy of questioning. So I'm going to take unconventional as I am, and as I've always been. If you'll give me permission in the middle of a memorial lecture, maybe you don't sing Tiruki. But if you don't mind, to Lakshmi and his great support of the RTI, Shankar and friends will come and we'll just sing two lines from Janne Ka Haq. And Janne Ka Haq is really the song which epitomizes for me, in many senses, the stories we have heard. So stories and songs have been very important to convey political information without getting into the ire of local political goons or the larger political mandate. And I always think of Mullah Nasruddin's story of his hunting for the key. And when he was hunting for the key, his neighbor said, what are you hunting for? He said, I'm hunting for my key. And he said, where did you lose it? He said, inside the house. He said, why are you looking for it in the courtyard? He said, this is where the light is. <laughs> so all public policy has been where the light is, where there's convenience. But the rights-based legislations went into the dark. They went and sat with people where even a single candle gave enormous light. So we lit the small candles wherever we were, the forest rights, women's rights, any rights you talk of, educational rights, information rights, work rights. And so this song, Jan Ne Kahak, two lines or three lines of it, and I go back to what I say. But since I am an activist, and I hear I want to say two things about Lakshmi, and then we'll hear this song. Lakshmi, in 1996, when we were sitting on a protest in Biawar, I wrote to Lakshmi, who was then ambassador in, the, in South Africa, saying, Lakshmi, we are sitting on this huge campaign. What solicit your support. He wrote back to me saying, Aruna, it's a wonderful thing, and you must continue to struggle, but you won't get it in your lifetime. He said, be ready for a huge struggle because you won't get it. And far from being demoralized by Lakshmi's letter, we got strengthened further. We didn't feel demoralized. We feel a realist. Because as a lawyer from Biawar said, Muddha bohat acha hai. Ek kod, Lakshmi. Muddha bohat acha hai. Isme ladte roho, magar is zindagi mein aapko nahi milega. Kyunki aap ye sadi gali vivastha se keh rahe hai, कि अपने कलेजी निकाल कर बाहर रखो तो वो रखेगी क्या? So there was no chance. So anyway, I remember Lakshmi at so many points in my life and this song. मेरे सपनों को जानने का हक रे मेरे सपनों को जानने का हक रे क्यों सदियों से टूट रहे इने सजने का नाम नहीं क्यों सदियों से टूट रहे क्यों सजने का नाम नहीं मेरे राम को ये जानने का हक रे रहमान को ये जानने का हक रे क्यों खून बहेरे सड़कों पे क्या सब इंसान नहीं मेरी जिंदगी को जीने का हक रे मेरी जिंदगी को जीने का हक रे अब हक के बिना भी क्या जीना ये जीने के समान नहीं
This song was composed by Charul and Vinay Mahajan. Uh, Vinay is a product of, I don't know whether he was a student when Trilochan and the, the, were teaching. Uh, he's a, from the IIM Ahmedabad. And Charul's an architect. And they've been composing songs for all sorts of campaigns. And this has become a signature tune. It's a song that tells you what RTI is about. Five lectures, 20 lectures, where brilliant people, analyses, wouldn't have told people. This song tells you exactly what it does for you. For each kind of ailment, for, for resentment, of distress, what it can do for you. And it's even now sing in, sung in Pakistan. They don't know Vinay or Charul. But Jan ne kaha ki sung in Pakistan. Wherever Hindi or Hindustani or Urdu is understood, the song is sung. One of the aspects of civil disobedience, and I think I would like to take just three minutes talking about it, that it's just not only words. It's a question of how you reach and communicate with people. And civil disobedience has this extraordinary power. And that's why when Gandhiji started on the Dandi March, there were not a huge amount of people. 70 odd people, if I'm not wrong, who started the Dandi March. But they changed the entire architecture of the Indian national movement. So it's not the numbers that you are sometimes, it's what you say and how you manage to communicate the seed of that idea. And I think we've all studied him as a great strategist. And Lakshmi, in many ways, in his casual conversations, used to tell us so many things about how Gandhiji worked. And as a strategist, I think he was extraordinary. So today, the relative truth of a contract has killed people. Asking for information about corrupt politicians has killed people. More than 70 RTI users have been killed since 2013. And though they have sacrificed their lives for this country, this continues to be used, this act. And 60 to 70 lakh people use this act every year because it has legitimized the kind of questioning in a civil disobedience framework that was framed in this country. That's why the Indian law has contributed specially to the world lexicon on how you can work through a civil disobedience movement, you can work with people to change the contours of governance. Other governments work from a different format. I mean, other countries have worked from a different format. This three or four decades of public action, and I think extraordinary public action. I'm just reading a book on the Narmada Bachao Andolan, which is a it's called Plural Narratives. It's a collection of stories of the invisible people who have really kept the Andolan going and are still at it when everything seems so bleak about Sardar Sarovar. Extraordinary stories. And when I read those stories and when I see Ram Lal or when I see Paras so or when I know about Narayan or Lal Singh or Chunibai or Norti, I feel that there is such a texture of solidarity and unity in the people of this country. They speak different languages. They are fighting for different rights. But they are the true Democrats. They are the people who want democracy for what we dreamt of, the kind of democracy that's defined in the Constitution of India, the kind of democracy that we should all really be fighting for, but I suppose we get sidetracked. So it's they bring you back to the reality of what a real civil disobedience movement should be like. And neither in these movements, whether it is the RTI or the NBA or the NFSA, the food security movement, the MGNRG movement, has violence been used. And yet these have been successful movements. The NBA, though it might have failed in actually stopping the Sardar Sarovar, Sardar Sarovar Dam from being built, has contributed in the world to a different way of looking at development. It's been a phenomenal movement. And I want to tell you all that every Indian movement that has come subsequently has learned from NBA. So we don't gauge the success and failure of a movement only from whether the object has been achieved or not. There are so many other ways in which we do it. So the rights-based legislations have given us a kind of legitimacy in this country that you can really, through fighting in the format of civil disobedience, get you away even from an uncivil government. And not always has the government been civil. We've gone through several governments. For 11 years and 12 years, we fought these battles. It hasn't been just five years. And every five years, the government changes. 
but gave a legitimacy and the forming of a fraternity became possible. And it's so important to say this today because you can't form a fraternity in this country today. They're stopping us from forming fraternities. So it's equality, liberty, and fraternity. But it has allowed a kind of fraternity to develop so that when you go sometimes to Jantar Mantar and Parliament Street, we are 14, 15, 16,000 people from 200 organizations or 500 organizations. Farmers from all over India can collect. It's this kind of unity of purpose and idea which it has allowed. It has given India hope. But if you look at the other side, there has been an assault on rationality. And all of us who believe in reason are fighting. I know many people in this room have done extraordinary things, but as a voice, our voice has been weak. Universities, individuals have all been brought down. Rationality is now absolutely in the dark. And Dabolkar, Pansare, Kulbargi, Gauri Lankesh, who are big names who have lost their lives. But there are so many others in the villages, so many other people, just for speaking what is rational, you're just killed. And I think the, the brazen way in which killings are taking place in this country today is shocking. So it's on the one side we have lynching, on the other side we have these horrible deaths. Representative politics has unfortunately failed us in all this. It has not been strong enough. So there's a big argument for participatory democracy and participatory democracy can only strengthen itself through the forms of civil disobedience and protest and resistance that are important to us. And we want to fight for spaces. In every movement, there have been seeds of very important kinds of democracies that we want. There isn't agreement amongst us all the time. There is a lot of disagreement. But in the settling of our disagreements, I think we've been very democratic. And we also understand how difficult it is. Because when you want to arrive at a consensus, it's not easy. So what they're deliberating today about those chief ministers, at one level, I'm irritated. Why can't you quickly decide who's going to be the chief minister of Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh? But I also understand that if you go through a process of deliberation, then it may take time. Whether that's the right thing to do or not, I don't know what Trilochan thinks about it. He might want a quick decision, but the point is, is it possible to take a quick decision with participation? No, I'm just asking you. <laughs> so the rule, the rule of law, which we all took for granted, has got completely and totally turned on its belly. So I'm really confused. People talk about the law, they're talking about misuse of the law. And when you talk about justice, you are, you are the, the culprit, you are the protagonist, you are the person who's the, uh, who is the criminal. This complete volte face that has happened in the public domain is frightening. And <clears throat> especially in the Dalits, when they got together for one day to protest all over India, just to protest that what was being said by the Supreme Court on reservation was not acceptable, and they protested. I've heard so many people say, oh, why did they have to do it? The others have done it millions of times. Why can't Dalits do it? What's wrong when they're doing it? And why should these cases be framed against them? If you look at the nitty gritty of it, it's shocking, and they've attacked, every government has attacked people who are the middle class amongst the Dalits, people who are working amongst the Dalits. So we have to now really look at how do we disown this violence? And how do we own fraternity and compassion? And two, very quickly, two movements, which are very important in my opinion. One is the not in my name movement, a spontaneous movement, which said, this is not what I want. And I'm really happy that women did it. And of course, there are other movements also which have happened since then, but I won't go into it. But not in my name was a moment of pride for many of us that at least there's someone who comes out there and says, say what you like, but not in my name. It was an important movement. And so resistance and protest have taken very different forms. There's also been an Aman Karwa, which has been doing the rounds of India, somewhat profiled, somewhat quiet, talking about compassion being the main connect rather than hate amongst communities. It is, leaves me with a big question. And that question is again answered 
by touching the real issue of people. The real issue, like the MG and RGA, which talks about what is the real issue. Real issue is poverty. Real issue is hunger. Real issue is lack of employment. The moment we talk about it, bang comes the answer. You're Muslim, you're Hindu, you're Christian, you're Jew, you're this, you're that. And you're a woman, you're a man, and we're fighting each other. So one of the most important things of the MG and RGA movement were our slogans. Har haat ko kaam do, kaam ka pura daam do. And trishul nahi, talwar nahi, kaam ka adhikar chahiye. So we neither want a trishul nor a talwar. We want employment. And these somehow managed to bond people together. And I remember we had a very important meeting in the Constitution Club in the Speaker's Hall where we had VP Singh and we had all the political parties which were interested in passing the law and there was Lakshmi. And I remember after we had gone through the whole thing and we are not going to sing that song today because there's no time, there was a song which moved him so much. He came to the mic and said, this People's Assembly passes the MJNRG. We don't want the parliament. If the parliament will not agree, if we pass it, we have passed the MJNRG. And it gave strength to all of us to hear a stalwart like Lakshmi say that, and we carried on. It didn't end there. There was K.R. Narayanan. There were so many others. And it carried on and on and on. But the point is, the People's Assembly and what it does for a certain thing is also the flip side of civil disobedience, and it's extremely important. We have finally decided in this country that the vote is the most important thing and that the rest of, the pol rest of politics is unimportant. But again and again, we have to say that the conscience, the politics of conscience, the politics of choices, the politics of what kind of development, the po politics of what farmers will do or not do, the politics of whether you want a smart city or not, whether you want displacement or not, whether you want GM foods or not, whether you want cooperative farming or not, whether you want, there's so many millions of questions which we don't address. And these questions knit together the framework of a rational government, of a polity that really addresses people, that gives equality to ideas and to positions, not merely equality through the vote, which Ambedkar so often talked about, that through the vote you give get political equality, but how long will it take to get economic and social equality? So we cannot, therefore, have the vote for comfort and a movement for justice. We simply can't. We'll have to match the two. Of course, we have tried. I won't go into it because that's another lecture. And what happens when you move from movement to politics? What do you compromise on? What do you give up? Can you have politics without values? And can you have a movement within the political structure still stand before this country as a huge conundrum which we have to decide how we will solve. And I think civil disobedience is a very important means of edging us towards that, and that's why when the movements were supposedly shrunk in Jantar Mantar, because the television cameras didn't trail us from one place to the next, for some years it was, it was a misnomer because Movements don't happen in Jantar Mantar. Movements happen in this country in multiple places. With Uday Kumar fighting in Tamil Nadu, you have farmers fighting in Karnataka, you have so many multiple kinds of struggles all over this country, which is where the real struggles are, where the real democracy is, and where we change and can change the contours of this country. Question is, through civil disobedience we can, but will you join us? because it requires numbers. It requires a cross-section of India. It needs people from different aspects, with different aspects to their thinking. As in the MGNRGA, we got economists, theorists, fine, people who knew money and financing, people who knew labor, people who knew the peasants, people who knew everything who came together. And that's how our argument was irrefutable when the big economists with the government had something to say about our financial status. Economists of equal caliber standing next to us could say something different. So in this argument, we are all required as to whether we can or we can't. But I don't want to end with a negative, on a negative note. So we're going to sing a song again and end this with a song. It says, Chahe jo bhi ho, kar lo, hum to badte jayenge. And positivism is an important thing. It's a self-satisfying prophecy. And I find the more we say, nahi ho sakta hai, it will be nahi ho sakta hai. 
and the more we say ho jayega it becomes possible so i think the positivism of that song we'll just end with that song and then i leave it to trilochan to take it further ना लाटी है ना गोली है ना राज मारा है ना जेल है ना जाल है ना ताज मारा है हम गीतों ना गोली है ना राज मारा है ना जेल है ना जाल है ना ताज मारा है हम गीतों से नारों से आवाज उठाएंगे चाहे जो भी कर लो हम तो बढ़ते जाएंगे चाहे जो भी कर लो हम तो बढ़ते जाएंगे जिंदाबाद 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 ये रात काली पूछती है क्यों ये काली है किसने हमारी चांदनी हमसे चुरा ली है हम जुगनू हर अंधेरे का हिसाब मांगेंगे चाहे जो भी कर लो हम तो बढ़ते जाएंगे सो इन दीज अनसिविल टाइम्स वेन एवरी वेयर दे समी स्टैंडिंग टू सी हाउ दे केन नैब यू एंड पुट यू इन जेल it's the songs and the slogans that have carried us through very difficult times and shankar was hit on the arm by an mla because he sang this song dislocating it when we were stopped they couldn't couldn't put us behind bars saying that you are anti national because the songs themselves proclaimed that they were not anti national so i think we have to find methods of protest methods of non violent resistance which will take us much further and that is a great heritage and in that great heritage lakshmi was a very important person thank you very much wonderful thank you uh ladies and gentlemen we've just heard a very thought provoking inspiring and challenging lecture the challenge came in the end when she said will you join us several of us here are already with her but the challenge remains what all can we do after such a lecture there is really nothing i have to say uh, a vote of thanks is a very mundane uh, and routine activity but i do want to say one little thing that aruna quoted howard zinn and when she said that the problem is not disobedience the problem is obedience all over the world <laughs> democracy all over the world seems to be under attack or and or in retreat be it the us be it france be it uh, turkey be it be the philippines and be it india so it is for all of us to see what we can do to protect this precious social activity so obviously aruna needs to be thanked for all that she did uh, she took time she spent time with us she gave us a lot to think about a lot to do obviously the india international center deserves thanks for allowing us to do this here uh, i would also like to thank my colleagues from adr and justine who did a lot of behind the scenes work and lastly there is no gain saying is saying thank you very much for being here with us this evening without you it would not have been what it has been so thank you once again and ladies and gentlemen you have a nice evening thank you